to see what I have to show you, but unfortunately the two of us have very little time. They're coming for you, and I don't know what they're going to do if they find you. I can help you, but only if you do exactly as I say. Watch this video, and perhaps you will have a chance. Good luck. Internet, welcome to Film Theory. I'm glad you decided to stick around because there is much we have to discuss. When it hit theaters in 1999, The Matrix was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Well, unless you keep up with any form of cyberpunk, had ever read a philosophy textbook, were a fan of Japanese anime or kung fu films, had ever watched Tron, yeah, you get the idea. But hey, that makes complete sense when you consider that the film's creators, writers, and directors, the Wachowskis, were absolutely massive fanatics of all of those things, and wanted to add to those genres with a film that incorporated elements from all of them. And the world they created, well, accessible enough to be mimicked in hundreds of parodies, long before poop emojis became a way to ironically say, I love you, or less ironically, I have to poop, has long been debated and reinterpreted by the same over-analytical fanbase the Wachowskis themselves hailed from. And you know that where there's over-analysis to be had, the theorists will follow. So I dug through the awesome first movie, the not-so-awesome CGI of the second, and the philosophical ramblings of the whole series, only to discover that we have been completely wrong the whole time. That the hero of humanity, named The One, he who is prophesized to bring about the downfall of the machines and reload the Matrix is not Neo, despite his name being a clever anagram of one. No, put aside Keanu Reeves' highly emotive face, the one is in fact... <laughs> Agent Smith, the cold-hearted, murderous hater of humanity and the bad guy trying to stop Neo, is in fact the hero who sets in motion the destruction of the Matrix and humanity's freedom. Let's see how far this rabbit hole goes. Now I'm gonna assume you need a bit of a refresher on what the heck this trilogy is about beyond white dreadlocks and Christ imagery. So let me do a real quick recap for you first. In the first movie we meet Mr. Anderson. I can't do it. I, I can't do the voice. In the first movie we meet Thomas Anderson, a hacker, co named Neo, who is disillusioned with his job, his life, and reality itself, until mysterious messages lead him to Morpheus, who totally blows his mind when he tells him that the world as he knows it is a computer simulation, and humanity is enslaved by machines who use this digital reality, or the Matrix, to keep humanity submissive while they harvest their body heat for energy. Whoa. Turns out, Neo is the subject of a holy prophecy. He is the one. Humanity savior, who has the ability to transcend the laws of this digital reality in such an advanced way that he can do amazing, epic, not at all ripped off from Dragon Ball Z-esque things. All hail the coming of the One and the destruction of the Matrix, right? Well, as the architect explains in the second movie, in a monologue that's gone down in history as one of the single most confusing things ever said by an actor in a major blockbuster ever, Neo's special status is all part of the machine's master plan. You see, another name for the one is the Prime Program. He's the result of an imperfect system. You know how when you divide numbers together, you sometimes get a remainder when they don't divide in perfectly? The one is basically all those remainders glommed together into a big number ball. And as long as he exists, the Matrix will remain imperfect and gradually descend into chaos until it crashes and destroys all of humanity, including its last stronghold, the sweaty dubstep-fueled rave cave of Zion. <laughs> Long story short, humanity will be extinct. In order to prevent this, the One's code needs to enter the source, which allows the Matrix to reload and everything to become perfect and stable. Eventually, Neo goes to the source, jacks in, fights Agent Smith, an AI program tasked with keeping order in the system, loses, or 
wins? And since Neo is plugged into the source over at Machine City, the anomaly goes bye-bye and the Matrix is able to finally be reloaded, bringing peace to the struggle between man and machine, with blind Jesus Neo being carried off into the light. The end, clear as mud. But what's easy to lose amidst all the black trench coats and bullet time effects are the details. For instance, let's look at the aforementioned prophecy. Quote, When the Matrix was built, there was a man born inside that had the ability to change what he wanted, to remake the Matrix as he saw fit. It was this man who freed the first of us and taught us the truth. When he died, the Oracle prophesied his return and envisioned that his coming would hail the destruction of the Matrix and the war, bring freedom to our people, end quote. So if Neo is truly the one, he needs to have been born in the Matrix, is able to change it, and ultimately destroys it to set humans free. Let's start with the first criteria. Born inside the Matrix. Uh... No. Neo was not born inside of the Matrix. He was born in one of those gross harvest pods by the machines. He even has the extra electrical outlets on his body to prove it, which are so useful during the holiday season. To be fair, Neo was reborn inside the Matrix after being killed by Agent Smith at the end of the first film, but keep in mind that the Oracle's prophecy also specifies, quote, when the Matrix was first built. And, as we're told in the film, this is the sixth version of the Matrix. The Matrix is older than you know. I prefer counting from the emergence of one integral anomaly to the emergence of the next, in which case this is the sixth version. Mr. Anderson wasn't around way back then. You know who was, though? Agent Smith. Smith has been there since the beginning. Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. It was a disaster. He speaks about it in a way that implies that he was there. But not only that, he goes so far as to call the Oracle Mom in the third movie. You would know Mom. So, despite him being just a computer program, the idea of birth still applies. But look at it a different way. At the end of the first Matrix, Neo jumps into Agent Smith, destroying him from within. But that moment fundamentally changes Smith. He's reborn in the second movie as a rogue virus. As he explains to Neo, Because of you, I'm no longer an agent of this system. Because of you, I've changed. I'm unplugged. I'm a new man. Which just goes to show one other way that Smith was born inside of the Matrix. Okay, but let's move on. The second part of the prophecy says the One will be able to change the Matrix, to remake it as he sees fit. Although Neo shows some real promise at the end of the first movie with his jumping inside Smith fatality, that's pretty much the end of his endeavor to do any kind of next level hacking. Neo doesn't actually change anything throughout the sequels. Sure, he can do some kung fu moves and fly, but that's... That's about it. When it comes to changing the fabric of the Matrix, the way it behaves, Smith shows far more power. I mean, check out how the Matrix looks by the end of the series when Smith is at the height of his power. It's unrecognizable. And very clearly, the one who made those changes was Smith. In his own words, You like what I've done with the place? But Matt Pat, you might be saying, don't you know that Smith is only special because Neo is special? When Neo jumped inside of him at the end of the first movie, he copied part of himself onto Smith. Interesting, theoretical theorist. So you're suggesting that Neo caused is Smith's exceptional powers, but not so fast. The quality that determines if someone is truly the one is based on the ability to rebel against the machines. Like Morpheus says, Yet their strength and their speed are still based in a world that is built on rules. That makes sense. Machines are just a series of zeros and ones, so of course they're bound by the rules of their programming. But wait then how do you explain this scene? In the first Matrix, Smith takes out his earpiece while interrogating Morpheus and explains his desire to escape the Matrix. I must get out of here. I must get free. And when the other agents walk in and see him without his earpiece in, they scold him. Smith is a program meant to ensure the security of the Matrix. That earpiece is his direct line with the system. And here, it appears as though he's going rogue. Not only does the fact that Smith is able to go against the rules and take out his earpiece suggest his heightened ability to rebel, but everything he says in this scene is oddly human talking about smelling and tasting humanity and being disgusted by them it's the smell i can taste your stink 
long before he takes on Neo, Smith is working against his programming. Smith not Neo, is the anomaly in the system. And now for the final tenant of the prophecy, that he would bring destruction to the Matrix and bring freedom to the people and end the war. Okay, so although the saga ends with the Matrix still intact, it gets pretty banged up during the Smith-Neo final battle, and in reloading, one could say that it was destroyed. And look who says that he's actually going to destroy the Matrix. You guessed it. Smith. And the only reason that the war between man and machines ends is because Smith is so darn good at tearing up the fabric of the Matrix that the machines can't control him anymore. This precarious position Smith puts the machines in is what gives Neo the bargaining power to strike up a deal with Babyface over here that allows the humans who want to stay in the Matrix stay, and the EDM fans who want to leave and head to the concert in Zion go over that way and get all sweaty. Neo might be the one making the deal, but without Smith's uncontrollable power, the machines wouldn't need to end the war in the first place. But here's the detail that seals the deal. The Matrix will reload when the remainder code of the One enters the Source. Smith openly says that he's avoiding returning to the Source after merging with Neo in the first movie. In his own words, he's been compelled to resist the call. Afterward, I knew the rules, I understood what I was supposed to do, but I didn't. I couldn't. I was compelled to stay, compelled to disobey. But for that final battle, Neo uploads himself into the Matrix from Machine City. At the end of the battle, Smith, victorious, assimilates Neo into a final Smith clone. But then this breaks him up, and all the Smiths blow up for some unexplained reason. This always confused me. Why does Smith lose? It's really unclear, and it feels like a cheap ending for such an awesome villain until you consider what's happened. Smith infects Neo, who is jacked into the Matrix from Machine Machine City, aka the location of the Source. When Smith assimilates him, his code is getting jacked directly into that Source. As the Prophecy and the Architect have said, the Prime Program in this instance has been reinserted. Look at how Neo's body and the wires he's connected to respond in the moment of his assimilation. In that moment, through Neo's assimilated body, Smith's anomalous code is reunited to the Source, and the Matrix is finally able to reload. Let me make it clear. He is the one, but he's the unwitting one. He's the savior of humanity without even intending it, or wanting it for that matter. But that all leaves us with one final question, and it's a simple one. Why does everyone call Neo the one if he's not the one? The one. 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 Sure, Morpheus and the Dirty Sweatshirt Gang may just be mistaken, but what about the Architect? Or the Oracle? These are two of the most powerful programs in the system, and they should probably know, right? Well, one of them does. In his rambling speech, the architect says it was the Oracle who created the One. Not only does this strengthen the whole mom argument with Agent Smith from earlier, but it also shows that she's the only person who truly knows the One's true nature, the One's true identity. I'm not the One. Sorry, kid. And what does she do with that knowledge? She chooses to lie to everyone else about it. In the final lines of the franchise, the Architect and Oracle meet in the Reloaded Matrix, with the Architect saying, You played a very dangerous game. What's he talking about? What is this dangerous game? Well, it's a reference to the lie. She told everyone that the one was Neo when she knew it was Smith. Why would she do this? She says in these final moments that she wanted change. But what does that mean? Well, it was the only way that she could get peace. Had the machines known it was Smith all along, they would have assimilated him into the system earlier, and the war between humans and machines would have continued. But by misleading everyone into thinking it was Neo, it allowed Smith to threaten the fabric of the Matrix, to the point where the machines had to make a deal of peace with Neo. Creating an elaborate lie was the only way to truly change the system. The dangerous game was allowing a rogue program like Smith to get as powerful as he did. Boy, did she do a good job of covering up the truth, since it fooled all of us too for over a decade. Agent Smith, that rainbow over there, it's for you, buddy. You truly are the one. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.
Subscribe, dear viewer, and you will have your eyes open to the truth in the realms of TV and cinema. Plus, we have another Matrix episode coming down the pipeline, so you'll want to subscribe so you don't miss that one. But if you're ready to go further down the rabbit hole for more Matrixy goodness right now, then click here to check out my friends over at the Wisecrack channel, as they take a deeper look at the Matrix Reloaded, exploring all the details we've been overlooking for years that give us a sense of the movie's true hidden meaning. Or click here to just check out their channel. Chances are you watch film theory for thought-provoking movie and TV-related videos, right? Well, these guys do just that, fusing education and entertainment into that sweet, sweet thing we call edutainment. I'm a huge fan of their stuff, and I think you will be too. So go ahead, click here, check it out. Now, if you'll excuse me, it is long past due that we talk about some Marvel. More on that next time. Mr. Ander- Nope, still can't do it. Damn.